So we get a lot of questions, and one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, can I get your inspection checklist? First of all, I consider our, our checklist proprietary, but it's proprietary in sort of all the wrong ways, where the reason it's proprietary is it's sort of, if you read through our checklist, you can see sort of the things that have bitten us on other programs, right? Like the reason we have to make sure we look for X is because, well, on another program, nobody did that, and maybe we didn't catch it till uh, later than we would, would like to acknowledge. Uh, so when we say the checklist, really you need to be th thinking about uh, you know, 43 and delta. It's the, uh, the inspection criteria that's called out in every condition inspection on every experimental airplane out there, and uh, it's the basis of what we're looking for. So when a customer asks, what are we doing in the inspection, I would say we're, we're doing a condition inspection. Typically the inspection that we do takes uh, a couple hours. I like to plan for three or four. Uh, we go through the paperwork, you know, we open up all the covers, we look at the flight controls, we obviously look at the engine, we look at the fuel system, we look at the electrical system, we look at the radios, etc. Uh, make sure the pilot fits in the airplane, make sure that the harnesses are safe and they're in a geometry that's not going to hurt the pilot if something happens. Uh, make sure that the emergency egress systems work. Um, you know, it's, it's standard stuff, but in the context of the flight test environment. While I say that that's the checklist, I think it's important to bring up what's actually going on. So yeah, we're looking for nuts and bolts and standard, you know, lefty-loosey, righty-tighty stuff, but what we're really doing is, is a little bit deeper than that. So um, number one is it's an interview with the owner about what are the expectations expectations of the day. Very directly, you know, you're you're brought out to do a thing. You want to make sure you understand what what the owner meant when they told you to do the thing, right? A lot of these cases during the inspection is the first time we're spending any face-to-face -face time with the owner. So uh, it's a great chance to sort of figure out what are their expectations? What are their background, right? Am I dealing with a, a bush pilot who's only dealt with fixed gear airplane, you know, ragwing construction? Or am I dealing with a, you know, an ex-military guy who's never flown anything this light before? Uh, and what we're really trying to do there is figure out what are the blind spots of the program, right? I, a lot of times, uh, you know, you can look at the airplane all you want, but everything you need to know is from talking to the guy that spent the most time with it. So, and that's typically the owner. So getting those expectations for uh, what does he expect? What does he know about what he expects? What does he know about the risks associated with it? Does he fully understand what he's asking you to do and how that puts the airplane at, at risk and, and therefore all, all of his investment. Uh, and, and the inspection is a great time to do that. Uh, the last thing is going over limits and uh, and, and envelopes and, uh, and starting to have the beginning of the conversation that would eventually end on a worst case day where you've melted an engine or crashed an airplane. A great example is CHT limits, right? So everybody knows that you can, you know, Google your Lycoming manual for your, your like homing 320 and you can come up with a number for a CHT limit. CHT limits mean different things to different people. It's not uncommon where you say to an owner, you say, oh, what's your CHT limit that you want to use? And they'll say, oh, well, the book says 440 degrees. Now, does 440 degrees mean you never want me to get to 440 or does 440 degrees mean if it gets to 440, but it's only on the climb and you're already pulling the throttle back, that's okay. Uh, does that mean you want me to land immediately? Does that mean we're gonna tear the engine down? Does it mean that you're gonna be annoyed if I taxi back and I'm like, oh, well, you know, it was 439 degrees and I didn't wanna let it get to 440, uh, et cetera. And trying to establish what the bounds of those things are, right? And when I say the context of the, the worst conversation, which is that last conversation, where you've you've damaged the airplane and you have to taxi back and they say you know you have to say well you know, we set this expectation this is how I said I was going to you know, manage for instance CHT so I'm going to pull the throttle back I'm going to make sure the mixture's full I'm going to accelerate the airplane whatever the deal is uh, and it did or didn't work but but again a lot of this stuff is about establishing you know what are the expectations what is acceptable uh, so that you can effectively be the hands and, and eyeballs of the owner uh, in the cockpit while they're on the ground. So, uh, first step was taking the airplane apart. So here you can see uh, Jose. It takes a step stool to take the cowling off the uh, the, the long nose thunder. So you can see getting the ladder, uh, take it out. They're all quarter turn cam locks, but they all fall out. So you get you know, it's a little bit tricky to get them out and get those all out. Pull the and then we're working together to pull the, the upper cowling. So because of the longer, uh, the extended nose of the long nose thunder, the cowling's longer and it's a little bit hard to manage with one person. So once we get the cowling off, of course, you open the uh, treasure chest. You want to take a look. So go in and take a look. Uh, and very quickly, it's obvious that, that some significant work has been done here. The Long Nose Thunder, when I was first introduced to it, uh, had the same four battery pack setup. Uh, it's a 24 volt system, so you use two batteries uh, ganged together to make 24 volts, but then it had two sets. And the one set was mounted there on the firewall, but the second set was underneath the engine. And in the case of when I was operating the airplane, those batteries were in a situation where they were getting really hot and uh, there wasn't a lot of battery left. Um, they were really poorly located. So you can see 
see the work that Quentin did to move those batteries back to the firewall. The other thing that's pretty noticeable here in this first moment is the, the header tank that Quentin had installed, which is the standard thing they do at Turbo Power Technologies that was invented, my understanding is, by Quentin's dad, John. Uh, and what it basically is, is it's a, you know, a can, uh, you know, uh, it appears to be steel, uh, mounted vertically, and then at the very top of it is a, uh, a level uh, indicator uh, light. So what happens is in the event that you drain a tank, you have you know, that much gas uh, to go before the engine's gonna flame out. And the way you know in the cockpit is when that first, you know, it's about two inches down from the top of the can, uh, when that when that fuel comes down to that two inch level, uh, a light comes on the cockpit and you have, you know, it's on the order of 30 seconds uh, to switch tanks or turn the boost pump on or whatever you're gonna do to try to keep the engine from flaming out. Uh, after looking around inside the cowling, then I started uh, just going through sort of st standard cockpit stuff, working through my checklist. Here you can see me checking uh, the trims, making sure that the, uh, the trims uh, fire the right direction. It's not uncommon for when the airplane gets taken apart or put back together for left roll trim to become right roll trim, etc. So it's just something that we check. Now I'm starting to work my way around uh, looking at the flight control. So here I'm removing the, uh, there's an access door there underneath the elevator, elevator to look at the bell crank uh, for the elevator. So uh, also through that access door, you can see the uh, uh, down locks for the tail wheel and then all the associated mechanisms. So the, the tail wheel, when it retracts, there's gas struts that push the, uh, uh, over centers in place. Uh, so those gas struts push the over centers in place, the hydraulic uh, actuator pulls against those, and then the tail wheel comes up. When it comes up, it hits a pad, and that pad retracts the tail wheel doors. Uh, more on that later. Uh, but now here you can see I'm inspecting all that. On the opposite side of the tail wheel is another access door which gives better viewing of the lock itself and then all the associated up and down locks. Uh, again, this becomes more important later. Uh, here we can see looking at the brakes, but you know, standard stuff looking at the, the uh, wear on the pads, looking at the condition of the rotors. And in this case, uh, the brakes are really critical because the airplane has so much thrust at idle. Uh, so you end up spending a lot of time thinking about the brakes. Here we are up in the gear bay, uh, looking at the inner gear door locks. So this was a major uh, sensitive spot on the program back in 2016. There were several times where I was getting ready to dive the airplane to do the high speed envelope expansion as part of the phase one flight test. And I would just start to lean the airplane over and I would get an inner gear door light in the cockpit which showed that the inner gear doors had come off the up stops. And what it basically comes down to is there's a latch that's tied to the up the gear uh, retraction extension handle in the cockpit and there's not a lot of spring power to pull that cable back. So there's a little spring down at the latch and there's not a lot of spring power to pull that uh, that bit of cable from the gear handle uh, in the cockpit down to the latch to allow the latches to extend to allow the gear to lock up. Uh, again, more on that later, but uh, it's a sensitive spot for this Thunder Mustang. My understanding is there are some mods for it, but this airplane doesn't have them. Uh, here you can see I'm pulling off the access doors for the uh, aileron bell cranks. Again, this is like standard annual stuff. It's not really associated with the specific work that have been done on the airplane uh, recently, but this airplane's been sitting, right? And uh, yeah, it had a condition inspection, but you know we're getting ready to fly it across the country. It's an easy thing to look at. Looking for slop in the controls, uh, looking for uh, making sure the right kind of hardware is installed, uh, et cetera. Here we go back up uh, underneath the cowling. Um, the big thing here is idle stop uh, and then the beta mechanisms, which we'll get to in a second. Then some cockpit cleanup stuff as I get ready to try the airplane on and make sure that all my stuff uh, fits in the airplane and the com cords, etc. Uh, the Thunder Mustang has surprisingly a lot of baggage. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. This Thunder Mustang has surprisingly a lot of baggage. I wouldn't be surprised if that baggage is limited when you have the radiator installed in the back. Obviously, this airplane doesn't have that. Here you can see I'm taking out all the seat cushions and getting the seat belt straight. Uh, having a nice sterile cockpit is uh, good for good flight test. So on this side of the cowling is the hydraulic pump. Uh, there's again more on this later, but the hydraulic pump in this airplane, my understanding is it's not stock. This is not the standard Thunder Mustang configuration. The pump is uh, sort of an oddball pump. It's an inexpensive pump, uh, but it's been a problem on the program. Uh, so here, while I'm uh, you know, looking the airplane over, it's a chance to get reacquainted with the, the uh, compromises that are the hydraulic pump. Uh, checking fuel levels. Uh, and, and there was more, but like I said, it's typically three to four hours to do that inspection. 